Hello and welcome back to Virtually Loads of Gordy. <laughs> Some scary bookies. He smells a little poopy. Wait, what? It's virtually loads of gaudy. I've seen a whole tub of Pringles and they're all in my teeth. It's so good to be back. It's been so long since I've been on YouTube. Uh, I can't think of any other excuses than uh, my children. Uh, we had a baby in January and babies take up a lot of time. And I got married <gasps> to a beautiful woman uh, called Becky. And uh, yeah, really, really happy. Really great wedding. I uh, got married in a kilt. I would put pictures up, but the sight of me in a kilt is probably more horrific than anything I've ever put in one of my books, and you would probably have to bleach your eyeballs. I hope you're all well. I hope you've uh, been reading and writing and doing the other things that other people do in life. I can't think of anything other than reading and writing. No, nope. but I hope you've been having fun doing whatever you've been doing. So the reason I'm back is because I have two new books out. Very, very excited about these. They are both books from the Devil's Engine trilogy. One is kind of a cheap book because it's already been out, but it's now out in paperback. Hellraisers. Hellraisers is just out in paperback. Really, really excited. It's a gorgeous book. For those of you that didn't get a chance to read it in hardback, here you go. The paperback version has just been released. Sorry, Pringles. So for those of you that didn't read the first book, or maybe it's been so long since you read it that you forgot what happened, here is the trailer to refresh your memory. So the Devil's Engine is a machine. This machine lies deep beneath the ground. It's centuries old. Nobody knows who built this machine. Nobody knows where it came from. Nobody knows how it works. But essentially what this machine can do is it can give you anything. If you make a deal with the machine, it can give you absolutely anything you can imagine. It reprograms the world around you. It reprograms your little pocket of reality. The only price you have to pay is your soul. Because after 666 hours, about 27 days, this machine sends its demons to come to collect. And these demons, they can possess anything that isn't alive, so they pull themselves out of the walls, out of the floor, they're made of bricks and stone, anything that isn't alive. And they won't stop coming after you until they've torn you to pieces and dragged your soul to hell. At the centre of the story is Marlo Green. Marlo is just an everyday kid from New York, and one day he gets pulled into a war when he sees soldiers battling demons. He joins a group of soldiers who essentially use the machine for superpowers, invisibility, super strength, speed, mind reading, anything you can imagine. Uh, and they use these superpowers to fight the evil on the other side of this war. And he joins them and yeah, that is where the, the story kind of begins. So this is Hellraisers, it's out now in paperback. I really hope you enjoy it if you uh, haven't read it before. And even if you have read it in hardback, read it again because it's so pretty. And the second book, the even more exciting book that is now out is Hellfighters. <gasps> the second book in the Devil's Engine trilogy. It is just out, it's fresh off the printing press. I'm so excited about this. I think this is one of the best books I have ever written. Everything that I ever wanted to put into a book went into this book. This is the middle part of a trilogy. It's usually quite difficult to do, but I really feel like this is my Empire Strikes Back. It, I, I really, really, really love this book. It starts off on a train that is thundering its way through the dark heart of Europe. 
and there is a fight on this train. And this is one of my favourite scenes that I've ever written. A fight on this train as it speeds its way through Europe. One of my favourite things about watching films when I was younger is when, you know, there was a, a fight or a chase on a train and they all got up on the roof and they were running along the roof and you knew that if you slipped off the roof you'd die and everything, and they go under tunnels and everything's woof, woof, woof past their heads. I wanted to put a scene like that in here and it is one of my favourite, favourite scenes. The middle of this book, again, one of my, well, I just absolutely loved writing it, takes place in one of the world's biggest underground, I think it is the world's biggest underground cemetery. Millions and millions and millions of people are buried here. I won't say where, where it is because it might ruin the surprise, but it takes place in this incredibly creepy place. I'm going to read you a section from that in a minute. The end of the book, the end of the book is, is just disturbing. I mean, even for me, once you get to a place uh, called Meridiana's Lair, things happen there. I just, yeah, I still have nightmares about it. Um, so yeah, it is one of my favourite books that I have written and I really, really hope you enjoy it. It is horrible, it is gruesome, it is exciting though and it's funny, there's still that humour in there. I really hope you enjoy it. Oh, I think I should read you the blurb. I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm not going to say too much about it, this is a really difficult trilogy to kind of talk about. It's difficult to talk about this book without ruining the, because there's so many twists and turns in this series, you know, you never know what's around the next corner. So it's very difficult to kind of say too much without giving anything away. But I'm going to read you the blurb, because it was very carefully worded. I didn't write it. My awesome publisher wrote it uh, very carefully worded not to give too much away. Okay, and I love this bit at the front. If you want to beat the devil, you have to raise a little hell. So true. So anyway, here we go. To stop evil, he made a demonic deal. Now it's time to pay the price. Thrown into a war against the forces of darkness, 15-year-old Marlow Green and his squad of secret soldiers must fight for control of the Devil's Engines, ancient, infernal machines that can make any wish come true as long as you're willing to put your life on the line. But after a monstrous betrayal, Marlow Pan and the other Hellraisers find themselves on the run from an enemy with horrific powers and limitless resources. An enemy that wants them defeated at all costs. Failure doesn't only mean a face worth a face, a face worth than death, a fate worse than death. This is a face worth than death. Failure doesn't only mean a fate worse than death for Marlowe. It means the total annihilation of everything. Kind of ruined the flow a bit there, didn't I? But anyway, when the world looks lost and the stakes couldn't be higher, just how far is he willing to go? So yeah, really, really exciting. Fate worse than death or face worse than death. Um, that's, you try and say it, it's very difficult. Fate, fate worse than death. It's really hard, especially when you've been eating lots of Pringles. But anyway, so yeah, really, really excited about this book. I really, really hope you enjoy it. So I wanted to give you a taste of the devil's engine and the horrors that you might find inside. And this was, uh, this, I had great fun writing this scene. I really, really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna read you a bit of this. I'm not gonna say too much about where it's set or where they're going or what they're looking for because it does ruin the surprise, but they are deep, deep, underground and they have crossed into something, I can say this, called the Liminal. Those of you that read the first book will probably have an idea of where they're going. Uh, a place called the Liminal and it's not very nice. Something snatched at her foot, a cluster of long bones. It punched a grunt of horror from her throat and she shook free, kicking the hand onto its back where it trembled like a dying insect. Or I should say, this place is full of dead bodies. <laughs> This one was decorated with smudges of rust-coloured blood that looked centuries old. Truck swore. He was skirting around a skull that was moving inside its nest of bone, its lower jaw twitching wildly like it was telling a joke. A scraggy cap of blonde hair hung over its side. The big guy was smearing his palms down his t-shirt again and again. Ignore it, Herc said. I Ignore the moving bones, Truck said, and Pan could hear the hysteria in his voice. Yeah, sure. His foot suddenly plunged into them, ankle deep, and his scream soared into the cavern like it was a trapped bird, fading fast. God damn it! He pulled his leg free and aimed the shotgun at the skull, firing off a blast that made Pan's ears ring. And in the flash of the muzzle, she saw something to her side, there and gone in an instant. Herc, you're three, she said, and Herc swung the flashlight. Ooh, three. Swung the flashlight. It looked like a huge moonlit ocean over there, bone white and restless. There was still no sign of the end of the cavern on the, or the roof, but she could hear the endless crashing crescendo of churning water. Water? Oh Jesus, said Marlowe, that, that can't be. 
hand stumbled on. Unable to believe what she was seeing, the ground before her seemed more agitated with each step, bones writhing against each other, scratching at the air, at their legs as they passed. Some of the skeletons had scraps of flesh and muscle, like leftover meat on a barbecued rib. One of the skulls had an upper lip, as fat and wet as a slug. It moved up and down in silent speech. Speech. I really can't speak today. Then she saw a face. A real face. It sat in the ground like it had been buried up to its neck. An old woman with patches of silver hair. The skin was withered and torn, one eye fused shut. But the other was a weak, watery grey thing that fixed on Pan and blinked furiously. The woman's mouth opened, and through it Pan could see the floor. Her scream was just a gust of dry air, but it felt deafening. Pan's terror was too big to fit up her throat, and she beat it back, forcing herself to stay numb. She felt a tickle of insanity in the corner of her mind, wondering how close she was to the abyss, to falling into that madness and drowning there. The closer she got to the ocean, the more she saw that there was no water there. It was a sea of flesh and bone, of things that could not possibly be alive, and yet were. Arms dug at the dirt, shedding fingernails in their desperation. Feet kicked at the ground, at the air, like the final awful mo movements of somebody trapped in a landslide. Limbless torsos twitched and trembled. And the faces, so many of them, they stared with red, bulging eyes, fat tongues sticking from their mouths as if they'd been hanged. They were obviously aware that they had company. Some of them cried. Some of them called out in a language Pam did not recognise. Most of them screamed, a rising wave of sound that rippled, rippled outward, surely loud enough to bring down the walls of the cavern, to bury them all forever. They screamed and they screamed and Pam put her hands to her ears and screamed too. Herc kept moving, shaking off the hands that grabbed at him as he waded deeper into the ocean. Pan's foot slipped on something wet and she looked to see a man's face there, gulping at air that he couldn't need because he had no body. His eyes scrolled blindly back and forth. Sorry, 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 she thought, but she couldn't find the strength to say. There, yelled Torp, his shout reduced to a whisper by the roar of the dead. He was pointing ahead and when Herc shone the flashlight, Pan could just about see a column of rock stretching up. Pan set off for it, moving too fast. Something grabbed her leg and she was falling, landing in the grasping ocean of wet flesh. Her fist plunged into a decaying torso, one that squirmed beneath her, which pulled at her. She was face to face with a man who had only half a head, the bowl of his skull gleaming. His one eye rolled her way and a toothless mouse moved against the mouth, moved against the air like he was trying to kiss her. She tried to get up, but something was holding her tight, fingers sprouting from the earth and groping for her, a leg winding around her waist like a wrestler's, another fistful of fingers probing into her mouth, tasting of spoiled food and old blood, another yet in her hair. Filthy nails scraping her scalp, and the man, his lips searching for her, breathing on her with the stench of old meat, that one eye rolling madly in its puckered socket. The fire burned up inside her, too much of it for her to control. She closed her eyes and let loose a pulse of electrostatic electricity. That's her power at this point. Uh, electrostatic energy, sorry. One that blazed out of her in every direction. The man's face erupted into ash, the ocean of limbs crumbling, freeing her. She pushed up, shaking the sparks from her smarting fingers. Her mouth tasted of copper, tingling like she bit down on a live wire. Easy pan, said Herc from somewhere behind her, his voice jittery. She ignored him, moving as fast as her legs would let her, not caring that her boots were crunching through faces, not caring about the crack of breaking bones and the slap of wet meat, meat beneath her. She just ran through the living corpses, through their endless screams, heading for that wall of rock. It rose from the living ocean, catching the swinging beam of Herc's uh, flashlight. She couldn't see to the top or anywhere near it, but she could feel how tall it was. The height was vertiginous, like she was standing in the shadow of the Empire State Building. There were openings in it, a collection of mouth-like caves running along the bottom. They looked like they might hold spiders, but they couldn't be worse than this. Nothing in all of hell could be worse than this. The countless shrieking dead. The caves along the wall grew vast as she approached them, each the size of an apartment block. She stumbled round into the nearest, the engine still pulling at her, still guiding her. Herc and the others were shouting, but she didn't care. She just wanted to be out of this nightmare. She felt that she would throw herself into the black pool, would gladly give her soul to whatever lay there, just to be free of this place. No light here, just more groping fingers and howling mouths. She pushed on, the ground sloping beneath her, gently at first, then hard. She lost her footing, sprawling, but the drop was too steep. The dead didn't have the strength to hold her. 
She rolled, bouncing between the moving corpses. She fired as she went, sparks of electricity exploding like a camera flash, glimpses of bared teeth of rabbit eyes. Then she was falling into something rabbit hole deep, aligned with fury, a pit of snatching limbs and jaws. She reached for them, trying to halt herself, but she was going too fast. The hole was narrowing too, arms and legs slapping against her from all sides. And I'm not gonna say what happens next. Partly because I don't want to tell you, and partly because these Pringles have really made my mouth water and it's difficult to speak. But anyway, that's a glimpse of the horrors inside Hellfighters. There are plenty more where that came from. If you love horror, if you love action, if you love a bit of comedy too, maybe even a bit of romance, then hopefully you will love this series. But to those of you who've read the first book, thank you. To those of you that I've read the second one, amazing. Uh, but to everyone out there, uh, yeah, I love you guys and I write these books for you, so I really, really hope you enjoy this one too. The third one will be out in a year's time. I know it's a long time to wait, um, but there you go. It's just the way it works. I really, really hope you enjoy it. And I'm gonna give, uh, I think, maybe three copies of Hellfighters away. Uh, so if you're interested in winning a copy of Hellfighters, signed, of course, all you have to do is comment below on uh, YouTube, not Facebook, I know this, book, this, this will be on Facebook, but comment below on YouTube, and um, yeah, I'll pick three winners at random in a couple of weeks, probably and I will send you a signed copy of this book. So that's probably more than enough of me for now. You've probably got much more important things to be doing, but I just wanted to stay in touch, let you know that I am back on YouTube. The next video that I will be doing uh, will probably be a Q&A, one that I promised you a long, long time ago. I do have a list of questions from you guys that I have been meaning to answer for ages. I will do a Q&A video next. If you do have any more questions, just add them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. In the meantime, just have an amazing life. I hope everything is well. Keep doing the things you love, keep writing, keep reading, and keep raising hell. And I'll see you all soon. He gets recruited by an army who use this machine to get superpowers to fight the evil uh, on the other side of this wall. Wall? Wall. Oh, wall. Think of Donald Trump.